It isn't my first time in Ireland, and obviously, actually, I live down the street a bit, and this is my public library, and um, it just seems to me, I've worked in libraries for many years, and I have a son and a uh, daughter-in-law work in libraries in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and um, it's, it's an honor to be here. It seems like there's, the libraries have always been important, but it seems to me that these days, you know, it's more important than ever to have a place where you can go and search for information and find it and, and, and do your own research and come to your own conclusions. Um, it's a crazy time in the world and, and probably will be for a while and public libraries are all under threat in one way or another, but this is more important than ever to me and so I'm, I'm honored to be in, at the Arlington Public Library. Um, my book came out in February, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this book, the High Noon book, though it turns out that there are copies of my, uh, paperbacks of my searcher's book for sale as well, and I just had a, a nice quick discussion with somebody who doesn't love searchers very much, loves Red River more, but we can continue that discussion <laughs> later too. But tonight we're going to talk about High Noon, at least to begin. Um, and, you know, looking at the audience, as you know, as most of you know, that long before Google and Harry Potter and $200 million you know, Batman blockbusters and even before Donald Trump, the biggest popular culture genre in America was the Hollywood Western. Um, these were you know, beautifully filmed movies with, with you know, lands breathtaking landscapes and cattle drives and gunfights and cowboys and Indians. And of course, they also had beautiful, obedient women. Um, and some of these movies were thrilling, and some of them were just awful. But they were movies about our country and our sort of cultural identity and our you know, American frontier legends. And they were also about our, our masculinity. Um, and in the 1950s and 1960s, uh, more than one third of all the movies made in Hollywood were Westerns. One producer said, you never lose money making a Western. And something like one quarter of all the TV shows were Westerns as well. And one of the very, very, very best of them um, came out in 1952 was High Noon, starring Gary Cooper. Um, so let me, I could guess, but let me ask, how many of you have seen High Noon? That's what I thought. But even if you've never seen it, even for folks who've never seen it, most of them, even young people today, can probably recognize this image um, you know, of Cooper, long and lanky and lean with the black hat and the badge, walking down what's soon going to be a deserted western street to confront four armed killers. Um, the title itself has become a bit of a legend. You know, it connotes a moment of truth when you have to stand up, reluctantly, but you have to stand up against evil. And maybe no surprise, but a lot of presidents have loved High Noon. Dwight Eisenhower loved it when it came out. Bill Clinton screened it something like 17 times when he was in the White House. There, there's something about, you know, the White House is kind of a lonely place, I guess, and you feel sometimes your friends and your political allies are abandoning you when the tough decisions have to be made. Um, and so, Folks tend to identify with High Noon. Um, it also was, um, you know, even political movements. This is solidarity uh, running in the first free Polish election in 1989. And there's Cooper. There's the marshal. He's carrying a, a, the platform of High Noon, and he's got a little solidarity badge. Platform of solidarity. He's got a little solidarity badge above his, his star. The movie was actually, it was filmed in something like 32 days on a shoestring budget. It was a rush job to fill the tail end of an old contract, but it did very, very well. It vaulted almost immediately to critical acclaim. People lined up to see it. It made a lot of money. It had a taut narrative, as, as you'll recall. Very powerful performances, a very evocative theme song, and a climactic shootout all of which made it an instant classic. And it won four Oscars that next year, including Best Actor for Cooper. And, you know, it's 65 years later, and it's still one of Hollywood's most en enduring films. But what's largely been forgotten is that High Noon was written and filmed during the height of the Red Scare 
and the Hollywood blacklist, a time of political inquisition and personal betrayal, and a time that I think has some very distinctive echoes of our own perilous political era. Uh, in the middle of the film shoot, its screenwriter, Carl Foreman, was called to testify before the House Committee on Un-American Activities about his former membership in the Communist Party. And Carl understood that it wasn't gonna be enough for him just to say, yes, I was once a member of the party, big mistake, I'm out of it, sorry I ever did it, and that that would be enough. Um, in order to prove your loyalty, he knew he was also going to have to accuse other people of being subversives, of being communists. He was gonna have to name names. And so it, it, it came down to this for Carl. Either you betray your friends or you lose your job and the wonderful career he'd worked so hard to achieve. And then as he pondered what to do about this, he began you know, to rethink his screenplay for High Noon and turn it into an allegory about the blacklist and the Red Scare. And the marshal was now Carl himself. And the gunmen coming to kill him were members of the House on american Activities Committee. And the hypocritical and cowardly citizens of Hadleyville were his uh, folks in Hollywood, friends and business partners, who either were standing by passively or actively betraying him. As I was writing the screenplay, it became insane because life was mirroring art and art was mirroring life. That's what Carl would say later about this. And I became that guy. I became the Gary Cooper character. Now, I guess I could just stop here and say, um, if you want to find out what happens, um, there are copies of the book there, and I'll sign them, and you can find out. Um, but I'm not going to do that. But, but before I go back to what happened, I want to set the stage a little bit. And, and since this is a movie, um, let's start with Gary Cooper. This is his home, uh, the, in fact, the place where he was born, near the state capitol in Helena, Montana, in in, uh, and it was in 1901. And Cooper arrives 23 years later in Hollywood, in 1924, when he's 23 years old, comes from his hometown. He's the son of British immigrants um, who had come to Montana in the 1880s. They'd actually met in Montana, and they'd stayed to settle there and had two kids. Um, and being a movie star was the furthest thing from Cooper's mind. He actually wanted to be an artist. Um, one of his fondest childhood memories was when his father took him to see this mural uh, painted by the famous Western artist Charles Russell. It's of Lewis and Clark and their encounter with the Flathead Indians in Montana. This, this mural still hangs in the state capitol uh, behind the speaker's chair in the House of Representatives. And, and, and Cooper was inspired by this. Now, now, his father was a lawyer. His father was appointed by President Teddy Roosevelt as the first US attorney in Montana, and later he served on the state Supreme Court. And when he retired, he ended up moving with his wife, Cooper's mother, to, to Los Angeles because of a big legal case he took over down there. And Cooper, unemployed, um, you know, not much going on, came down to spend Thanksgiving with his parents. And of course, like a lot of children, he never left. <laughs> he was tall, he was handsome, he had a killer smile, he had smoldering blue eyes, very quiet, laconic, sexy charisma. And he started getting bit parts as a stunt writer in, in westerns almost immediately in silence because he actually could write, he was the real thing. Um, and although he had no formal training as an actor, he quickly became a movie star over the course of three or four years. You know, uh, people like John Wayne and Humphrey Bogart, they took a decade or more of working in B-movies and slowly developing the sort of little touches and, and, and you know, uh, trademark things that eventually made them, you know, st developing their celluloid personas. Wayne learned how to walk. He learned how to talk in that slightly break the sentence in half thing and that crooked smile that he would give right before he punched you in the face. Um, but Cooper, Cooper rose right away. Um, his name was above the title by 1927 of, just, of every movie he was in and, um, and it stayed that way for more than 30 years. He really was the ultimate product of the Hollywood studio system. He made two or three movies a year, he seduced many of his co-stars and just about every other attractive woman he met in Hollywood, and a few men as well. 
And he made wonderfully successful films like Mr. Deeds Comes to Town and Meet John Doe, The Pride of the Yankees, and For Whom the Bell Tolls. And he won the Academy Award for Best Actor in 1941 for Sergeant New York. And that same year, the Associated Press reported that his annual salary was $483,000. He was the best paid actor in Hollywood at that point. But after World War II, the, the, the studio system in Hollywood starting to decline. Um, you know, audiences are finding other places to spend their entertainment dollars. The big movie houses are, are still downtown, whereas people are increasingly moving out to the suburbs. In 1948, the Supreme Court ordered the studios to divest themselves of probably what was the most profitable, pro profitable part of their business, which is to say the movie theater chains that they owned all over the country. And then, of course, the biggest destructive force coming over the horizon was a little thing called television. And between 46 and 49, the average attendance at movie houses dropped from 90 million people a week, 90 million people a week, down to 60 million, and profits plunged something like 70%. But their, their problems were, were more than financial. Um, the war had changed American attitudes and perceptions, and the old Hollywood films weren't necessarily up to the task. Uh, when the boys come home from the battlefields overseas, declared Daryl F. Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, who himself had just come home, they're coming back with new thoughts and new ideas and new hungers, and we've got to start making movies to match the new climate of the times. And you know, Hollywood did make some of those movies. Um, they made a wave of thought-provoking, socially conscious films, including Gentleman's Agreement, The Best Years of Our Lives. Um, which was about, as you may recall, World War II veterans coming home and having a difficult adjustment uh, to being back in peacetime, and all the King's Men and Body and Soul. These were tough, interesting new movies of the late 40s. Cooper was just 50 years old in 1951, but by then his career was beginning to fade along with the studio system. The roles he was being offered were increasingly mediocre. His daughter, Maria, told me they would send him these crappy scripts and at some point you have to do one of them. And he was furious at the quality of the material, she said. His health was slipping as well. He'd, he'd had a bad back from childhood that, that he never got over, ulcers, a hernia, and of course, and he was chain smoking three packs of cigarettes a day. And his marriage was unraveling. He'd separated from his wife of 17 years and he was coping with his tempestuous, beautiful 25-year-old mistress, the actress Patricia Neal. And frankly, Gary Cooper needed a break. He needed something different. And, and fortunately for him, a break was on the way. With the old studio system slipping in this way, a number of small, little, independent film companies were getting started. You know, today we'd call them entrepreneurial startups, you know, nimble and agile and all of that. Um, and um, they were making cheaper, smarter films. And one of the most successful was led by an ambitious young filmmaker named Stanley Kramer. This is Stanley with Marlon Brando in 1950. Stanley had arrived in Hollywood in 1936, just out of college, and he worked his way up through the system. He did just about every job you could do, every, every low-level job, from sawing and hammering you know, to build, building sets to cutting film, everything there was. In World War II, he served in the Army's documentary film unit, where he met Carl Foreman, who also served in documentary films at the time. And these guys were two young, ambitious, fast-talking Jewish intellectuals from New York and Chicago. They were both the sons or grandsons of immigrants from Eastern Europe. They both were very ambitious. They had a social conscious, conscience and a withering contempt for the studio system. And after the war ended, Stanley scraped together a little cash and launched what became the Stanley Kramer Productions. And of naturally, he asked his friend Carl to become a partner in the business. Their first hit was a boxing movie called Champion, um, about a ruthless and avaricious working class guy named Midge Kelly, who basically pounds his way to the top, stepping over his friends and his family on the way. Carl wrote the screenplay. It was taut and remorseless. And the movie starred a handsome young newcomer named Kirk Douglas, another son of Jewish immigrants. 
My favorite interview for the book was meeting Kirk Douglas two years ago in his house in Beverly Hills. He was 98 years old then, he's 100 years old now. Uh, his silver hair was pulled back in a little ponytail in the back, but he still looked trim and, and charismatic. Um, he told me he was mesmerized by Carl Foreman's screenplay, um, and he was determined to play the part of the anti-hero, even though his agent tried to steer him away to much more you know, lucrative second or third roles in major Hollywood films. But Douglas wanted this so much that when he came to Stanley's office to audition, he ripped off his t-shirt to show these guys that he had the muscles that it would take to play a boxer. And Champion was an immediate hit. It cost something like $550,000 to, ma to, to, to make, and it made more than 10 times that amount at the box office. And it was nominated for six Academy Awards, including Best Actor for Douglas in what was his first starring role, and Best Screenplay for Carl, his first nomination. And suddenly, Stanley and Carl were, were, were hot prospects. They went on to make Home of the Brave, a movie about racism in the army during the war, the Men, which was Marlon Brando's first movie. It's about paraplegic war veterans at a VA's hospital in Southern California. Um, and Cyrano de Bergerac, an adaptation of the Broadway hit. It wasn't just the hard-hitting, mostly contemporary subject matter. It was also the way these movies were made, on skin-tight budgets, in black and white, with a very talented uh, team of craftsmen you know, doing the editing, doing the directing doing the music, and Kramer recruited a gifted director named Fred Zinnemann to join the company on a three-picture deal. Fred came from Vienna. He, his, family, his family was a, a Jewish doctor and his wife, very high upper middle class folks. Eventually they were both killed in the Holocaust, but Fred came over in the mid-30s and he worked for MGM. He got a job at MGM and worked there for more than a decade. And he was known at MGM for his meticulous craftsmanship and his documentary style, visual style, uh, and of course for his utter undisguised contempt for the studio executives he was working for. And they were rather happy to see Fred go. Heinoon had, had a lot working against it. Carl Foreman had never written a Western before. Fred Zinnemann had never directed one. The screenplay Carl wrote didn't have any beautiful vistas. Uh, no cattle stampedes. Uh, you know, no, no gun violence until the very last reel. But what it did have were beautifully drawn characters and taut realistic dialogue and a suspenseful story that unwound in real time, exactly 85 minutes, or 80 minutes, between the time the retired marshal, who's just gotten married on a Sunday morning, gets a telegram informing him that his nemesis is coming back to town to kill him, and the arrival of the noon train that's going to bring this guy in, where he's going to be met by his three armed thugs. And the script abounds with clocks. As you'll recall, you know, each scene sort of begins or ends with a clock, with the clock ticking as we make our way towards noon. It also had a, a, a a haunting theme song, Do Not Forsake Me, Oh My Darling, written by Dmitry Tiamkin, incidentally, who's a Ukrainian Jew, uh, and Ned Washington, and performed by the great Tex Ritter. Um, this played throughout the picture. Now, Tex is not a Jewish immigrant. He grew up in, in the, the northeast corner of Texas, went to a one-room schoolhouse, lived in a very small ranch house, but Tex, I found out as I started researching this, went to law school at the University of Texas. And, got a, and had a law degree, so he started becoming a singer when he realized he could make more money doing that. But um, he was no dummy. The movie, besides, the, and this song was highly unusual, as you'll recall. The lyrics advance the story. Um, they're told from the marshal's point of view, and he's singing to his new bride and trying to explain to her in song what he actually can't explain in the movie. It's too bad the bride couldn't listen to the soundtrack. She would have heard an explanation of why he can't leave town and why he has to stay and confront these killers. The movie also had great performances. Kramer signed a young actress to play the Marshall's new bride. Grace Kelly was only 21 years old, um, and this was her first you know, serious movie role, but she already was a very experienced stage performer in New York. Kramer liked her, her fresh, beautiful look, and he also liked the fact she was willing to work for $750 a week. And the same was true of Katya Urado, 
um, a sultry young Mexican actress hired to play the lawman's former mistress, um, and who was already a movie star in Mexico uh, at, at age 24. These were two strong women characters, highly unusual, I'd say, for 1951. But the, their biggest coup was snagging Gary Cooper for a bargain price. Cooper knew a good screenplay when he saw one, and he knew a good role. Uh, ironically, both uh, Carl and Stanley were reluctant to hire him. They saw Cooper as a product of the old studio system, that, you know, a relic of the old studio system that they disdained. Um, plus, he was 29 years older and maybe a foot taller than Grace Kelly. Um, Still, I would argue they were lucky to get him. I think he brings an authenticity and a sense of vulnerability and pride all mixed together in a very interesting performance that none of the other younger actors they were looking at, I think, could have done. And Carl Foreman served as associate producer for the picture, which means, means he put together the locations and he lined up the rest of the cast and he really only had $30,000 for everybody else because even though Cooper was working at a bargain, it was still a lot more money than they had envisaged. So it was like constructing a human jigsaw puzzle, you know, had to get folks together to do their scenes at certain points and move things around. Everything had to fit perfectly. And it did. It really did. But there was, there was one obstacle Carl Foreman could not overcome. So the House Committee on Un-American Activities had held its first public hearings into alleged communist infiltration of the motion picture industry in 1947. They were held in Washington. Uh, over there, on the far left, I don't have a pointer, but that smiling guy, so looking over there toward the bottom, that's Gary Cooper, one of the friendly witnesses in 1947. But there were also so-called unfriendly witnesses. There were 10. Uh, people who direct screenwriters for the most part, but also a director and a producer who got contempt of Congress citations for refusing to cooperate with the committee. All 10 of them had been members of the American Communist Party and most of them still were. But the fact is that at first, they had a lot of support from the Hollywood community. Um, Humphrey Bogart, Lauren Bacall, Danny Kaye, and a plane load of movie star liberals flew from Hollywood to Washington to protest outside the committee room. Even Ronald Reagan, then head of the Screen Actors Guild, questioned the committee's bully boy tactics. But by 1951, the atmosphere was very different. The 10 had all been convicted of contempt of Congress. They'd all been sentenced and imprisoned for up to a year. And the convictions had been upheld by the Supreme Court. This is seven of them walking up to the courthouse in DC, the federal courthouse, for their hearing. After they were released in 51, the committee decided it would be a great time to come back to Hollywood for a sequel. You know, it's hard to overestimate uh, just how intense the fear of communism was in those days, in the early days of the Cold War. The Soviet Union had just developed the atomic bomb, which set off, what, a 40, and more your um, you know, nuclear arms race. Um, Julius and Ethel Rosenberg and their alleged co-conspirators had been arrested for stealing atomic secrets. By 1951, by September 51, when Carl was called to testify, more than 83,000 American troops had either been killed or wounded fighting communists in Korea. And at home, the old progressive Democrat-led coalition under FDR was beginning to unravel under his successor, Harry Truman. And self-styled Americanists, that's what they called themselves, believed that outsiders were taking control of our country's civil institutions and our culture and even our government. Usurpers, liberals, Jews, communists in those days, had stolen our country and our culture, and these self-appointed guardians of American values were determined to claw it back. And their anger and their rhetoric was just as corrosive and vicious as anything we're hearing today. That, incidentally, as I'm sure you can probably guess, is a very sincere young Richard Nixon uh, with fellow members of the House on american Activities Committee in 47. It's almost like 
the, the hearings were a training ground for future Republican presidents. In fact, for many Americans, communists posed even, an even more alarming threat than, say, terrorists do today. Um, I mean, communists, after all, could be anybody, your neighbors, your friends, uh, your close friends, your relatives, maybe even your spouse, maybe even my spouse. They looked and sounded like us, but they were agents of a ruthless foreign power that was out to destroy our way of life. They were the enemy within, the masters of deceit, as J. Edgar Hoover put it. Here's a quote. A communist is a completely transformed, unrecognizable, and dedicated man. This according to a spokesman for the American Legion. While he may retain the physical characteristics of the rest of us, his mental and psychic processes might as well be from another planet. In other words, they were the walking dead, but super smart. The truth is that the Communist Party was never very large or influential in Hollywood, and it was down to maybe 100 active members by 1951, one third of whom were probably FBI informants. <laughs> Didn't matter. The studios decided to fire and blacklist anyone who, who refused to cooperate. You know, in truth, Hollywood was just a mere sideshow to the larger struggle. I, I think I can say authoritatively that no atomic secrets were bought or sold in Beverly Hills. And no acts of sabotage or espionage took place. But the symbolic power of Hollywood, its extraordinarily high profile, and its abiding role in our national culture and our, and our fantasies made it an irresistible battleground. Few people would acquit themselves well, not the committee, certainly, which far exceeded its con the constitutional limits of its powers and sort of served as judge, jury, and executioner. They'd call you to testify. You couldn't bring a lawyer. The press would print whatever they said about you, whatever accusations were made. And there you were, and you had, there was no way to rebut that unless you cooperated. Um, certainly not, the, you know, so the committee, uh, the executive branch, uh, Truman and Eisenhower laid back and, and, and certainly and didn't intervene. The courts upheld the decisions, took a decade or more really to sort of curb the committee's abuses. Um, the studios caved out of fear for their profits and their prestige, and political liberals who were trapped between the bullying committee on the one hand and the dogmatic communist targets on the other, wound up aiding and abetting the blacklist in many ways. And uh, nor journalists, I have to add. Now some were, you know, some on the right wing cheered the committee from the sidelines, but even mainstream journalists, even at places like my own alma mater, the Washington Post, as I said earlier, it tended to print the accusations made in the public hearing without even bothering to get in touch with the people who were named. Um, and that's how it went, up and down the line. People lost their jobs, their businesses, uh, partnerships unraveled, friendships were destroyed, families even turned against each other. And the bitterest conflicts, I found out, weren't between political enemies. I mean, you didn't expect that you know, the committee was going to be nice to you. The bigger, bitterest conflicts were between friends and former allies and colleagues. And some of those remain you know, raw and unsettled even today among their children. When Carl Foreman was first subpoenaed in, in the summer of 51, Stanley Kramer gave him his full support. But as the time grew near for Carl to testify, Stanley grew fearful. He and his business partners had just signed a very lucrative six-year contract with Columbia Pictures. And they were all going to make a lot of money from this, including Carl. But they were afraid that if Carl refused to cooperate, Columbia would cancel the deal. They couldn't be seen you know, having a long-term contract with a company that had an ex-commie who wasn't cooperating with the committee as one of the partners. It just wasn't going to happen. So the fear was real. Kramer and Foreman were also at, at odds about High Noon, about the making of the movie. Stanley didn't like the dailies he was seeing at the end of the day. He thought that Fred Zinnemann's gritty documentary style was dark and unappealing. He also didn't care much for Gary Cooper's performance. He seemed not to be acting, but simply being himself. That's what Stanley said later about this. I think Cooper could have played the marshal in his sleep. There were times I thought that was just what he was doing. Not a compliment. 
So Carl, dressed in a dark blue suit and what he called a very sincere tie, took the uh, committee witness stand in LA on a Monday morning, September 24, 1951. And when asked if he'd ever been a communist, he denied that he was one now. But otherwise, he took the Fifth Amendment, refused to answer any more questions. When they asked the second obvious question, well, have you ever been a communist? He took the fifth. And he refused to name the names of anyone else. The testimony took less than an hour. And the next day, Stanley Kramer issued a statement citing a total disagreement between Carl Foreman and myself, and he pledged to take action. And soon after that, he fired Carl. They didn't wait, is what Carl would say later. They quit right then and there and threw me to the wolves. And Stanley and Carl, remember, former business partners and close friends, never spoke again. Carl's widow's Eve told me that her husband and Stanley many years later, ended up in the same elevator at Columbia Pictures. They didn't look at each other. They didn't say a word. They just looked straight ahead. Carl, soon after he lost his job, announced he was going to form a new independent film production company. And Gary Cooper, even though he was a staunch anti-communist and conservative Republican, announced that he was going to be part of it, that he would buy stock in it and they were going to make, hopefully make a picture together. He said he had grown to trust and admire Carl when they were working on High Noon, and he believed him when he said he wasn't a Communist Party member anymore. But immediately, Cooper came under extraordinary pressure from right-wing gossip columnists Hedda Hopper and Luella Parsons, who questioned what this sort of celluloid icon of American values was doing going into business with an ex-commie. Um, and from Cooper's right-wing Republican pals, including John Wayne. And Cooper takes off for Sun Valley, Idaho, to go uh, hunting and fishing with his good pal, Ernest Hemingway. And a few days later, he gets on the phone, he calls Hedda Hopper in Los Angeles, and he tells her that while he's still convinced of Carl's loyalty, Americanism, and ability as a picture maker, he's decided to withdraw. And that was it for Carl in Hollywood. Um, he was shunned, he couldn't get work, he couldn't write a script under his own name. And a few months later, he leaves for London, where he lived for the next 25 years. And one of his great achievements while in London, he writes a number of scripts for, under pseudonyms, and one of the best was one that he co-wrote with a fellow blacklisted colleague named Michael Wilson, The Bridge on the River Kwai. And it wins the 1958 uh, uh, Academy Award for Best Screenplay. Hard to see down there, though. The problem was neither of their names are on it. The name is Pierre Boulle, the French novelist who wrote The Bridge Over the River Kwai, a man who spoke no English, but managed to write a screenplay in English. It's a miracle. And it took another 27 years or so for the Motion Picture Academy to recognize the fact that, and deliver Oscars, recognizing that Carl Foreman and Michael Wilson had wrote this screenplay. And they gave the Oscars to Michael and Carl's widows, because both men were gone by then. Besides the political warfare, there were a lot of creative conflicts over High Noon. Once this surprising little movie did well, everybody wanted to take credit for why it was so good. Uh, Stanley said that Fred Zimmerman's cut, you know, uh, director's cut was flabby and that he edited it personally to give it that suspenseful charge it has. Elmo Williams, the film editor, says he's the one who did it. Fred and Carl both disagreed strongly. It's not uncommon for folks in Hollywood to argue over this kind of thing. I think they're still arguing over the use of the mechanical shark in Jaws. But it's fair to say that the conflicts over High Noon were nastier and more brutal because of the political bloodshed of the blacklist. So my book tells the story of the making of this, of this classic film against the backdrop of this tumultuous era of our history whose meaning still remains raw and, and unresolved. No one was put up against the wall and shot during the blacklist, but it was a time of hysteria and persecution, and a lot of innocent people were hurt. I can't pretend to have answered all the questions surrounding it, but I was lucky. You know, you get on the orange line and you can go straight, uh, well, you have to change trains to go to the National Archives. And a lot of, uh, of the committee's uh, formerly confidential papers were, have been released after the 50-year period. And so I had the chance to look at those. I also was able to uncover some unpublished interviews 
with Carl Stanley and some of the others involved in making the movie, and that I think has allowed me to present a more plausible account of who's responsible and deserves the credit for how, what a wonderful movie it is. And the short answer, I think they all do. I think High Noon really was a collaborative effort among a very talented group of people. And ultimately, that's what my book is about. It's about a highly talented group of people who came together to make a compelling, creative work. And what happened to them when they came up against the machinery of political repression? And you know, it raises the question that history demands of everyone. If we were confronted with the same terrible choice that these people faced, in this case, between betraying our principles or, or losing our livelihoods. In other words, when the clock strikes high noon, what would we do? 